Thank you for tuning in to the Money Game Podcast where every week I'll bring on a guest and we speak money, business and entrepreneurship. They'll share their stories and knowledge in the pursuit to empower us to better our own businesses and financial education situations. Introducing today's guest is Samuel Leeds, who is known just for that. Samuel's a very good friend of mine who's a successful property investor with one of the largest property training companies in the UK. He's well known for successfully teaching hundreds of people how to get started in property, whether it's those who have little to no money or those who have made good money and want to invest in property. And we go into all these strategies in the podcast. I don't think anyone's self-made. I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, I've done everything myself because yeah. I don't think anyone's self-made. And sometimes you can get to the top of the ladder and realize you're on the wrong ladder. Money won't change you, it'll just expose who you really are. And it's not about what you've got, it's about what's got you. It's a yeah. hard thing. It's Gary Vee, Samuel's big challenge is coming. If you're as excited as D-Rock is, you're fucking pumped. One of the best property trainers that there is out there, in my opinion, um, a controversial one. Any other names that they give you? You get quite a lot of names. The goats. Good and the goats. <laughs> the goat as well. Um, so what I love about you, Samuel, and the reason kind of why I wanted to get you on is because um, I think a lot of people maybe struggle to kind of conceive them improving their financial situation or, you know, playing the money game, whether, you know, they might have come from a, a background which, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. They maybe think, you know, the whole money game and for money is for rich people. And what I love about you is that um, you kind of make people feel that that's possible, yeah. even when they have very little. And I think that's kind of what you've done for me in, in, in terms of property. And I wanted to know the start of your journey. And because I know you came from a background that wasn't, you know, you wasn't given a silver spoon. You, you didn't start with much. And I wanted to know how, how you started your journey and um, what kind of mindset was you at when you kind of thought, you know, I'm going to start going on this journey to mm. make money and improve your situation? What was your mindset at that time? I think my mindset, because I didn't do that well in school, like I didn't, I didn't have a lot of options. So sometimes I'll, I'll meet people today, they're maybe 45 years old, they're working in the corporate world, they've yeah. got a good paid job and then it's like, oh, should I go into property? For me... I didn't do well in school. I didn't feel like I had much much options. I'm dyslexic. I've got ADHD. Um, and then when I read, it was actually Richard Branson's book. I read. I don't know if you've read it. It's called Screw It, Let's Do It. Right. It's an amazing I heard book. It, yeah. And when I read that, it's basically just his how he got into business and stuff. And I was still at school at the time, but that was when I realised I want to I want to get into business. Yeah. Um, didn't didn't have you know money behind me. My parents split up when I was seven, mm -hmm. and um, but that was for me kind of like where the fire came from. When yeah. I thought, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to be able to go to university. I haven't got yeah. much money. Richard Branson's also got dyslexic, dyslexia and this, that, and the other, and he's done really well in business. Maybe business. And they don't teach business at school. Yeah. So in school, it's like, do you want to be employed or do you want to be self-employed? Do you want to go and learn a trade and be a builder? Or do you want to go to uni and, and, and get academic degree? But there's no talk of business or investment yeah. at all at school. So I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So then, obviously, knowing that and knowing that there were, you didn't get much um, financial education when you was younger, how did you how, how did you get empowered to kind of go on that journey? I think I mean, in, in terms of m myself, I had a fire to do something great. Yeah. Um, you know, my my um, my family were quite supportive in a way. Some were, some weren't. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone's self-made. I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, I've done everything myself because yeah. I, I don't think anyone's self-made. Um, so, you know, I'm, I have to credit in all of those people, rich dad, poor dad, we were talking about, you know, all these, I just started immersing myself in books, you know, reading investment books. I went down to a property investors networking meeting as a teenager, felt yeah. like an idiot wearing like a suit and it didn't fit me properly. Um, but I think you just got to just throw yourself into it. And if you've got a fire and you want to be a property investor, you want to make money, yeah. it, it is possible. And that's why now I want to be able to give hope and, um, sort of, install belief into people yeah. that they can do it because I've done it and so have thousands of other people starting yeah. from nothing. Yeah, that's why I think you, you make people feel, and the um, results show for themselves as well, that mm. you know, it's not just a feeling, you actually help them do that. Mm. So a lot of people, for that I know, um, you know, a lot of friends, they think property is a bit unreachable. Yeah. And I think strategies that you teach in your, in your training is um, something where it makes them feel like, okay, this is reachable, this is possible. Um, so going back to where you started before mm. all of this, what kind of challenges did you have yourself at the start of your journey? Oh man, every challenge under the sun. <laughs> really? I mean, 
lack of knowledge, lack of finance. Yeah. I remember when I, um, when I, when I first start, started going into business and stuff, I was driving back from, I was seven, about 17, mm -hmm. I was driving back from a networking event and um, I was in you know, my, my little purple Ford KA yeah. with dents all in it. I bought it for like 400 quid and I ran out of petrol in the rain. I remember pushing my car to the nearest petrol station, got to the petrol station, put five pounds in it, just enough to get it home. Card declines. Had to ring my little sister who was still at school to ask to borrow a fiver. Right. You, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 so yeah. when I say I came from not a lot of wealth, like yeah. literally, I mean, I wouldn't say poor because of, I think that'd be an insult to people that are, you know what I mean? Like yeah, I had, yeah, had yeah. food on the table and, and everything like that, but yeah, um, yeah I've, been, I've been skint and that was a challenge. Yeah, so you, you started off kind of straight away, you kind of wanted to get into property. Yeah. At that time, you probably didn't have someone like you that you know, taught strategies of getting into property with little money. So no, I did actually. You did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, like, like who? Where'd that come from? So um, I went to several like property investors network meetings right. and the strategies were a bit different back then. Back yeah. then the strategy was to buy a house below market value and then buy it really cheap, get a bridging loan to buy it and then refinance it same day. Yeah. That was what everyone was doing. Right, right, right. So now it's like buy, refurbish, refinance, or packaging and selling deals. Or but back then, it, so it was, it was still, you know. And I kind of bought into that. And I remember some of my school friends at the time were like, "It's a scam, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a scam. What are you doing?" It's too good to be true. Is yeah, yeah. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, I got nothing to lose, man. Yeah. I've literally got nothing to lose. And the same people that were saying it's a scam, they went to university, right, right. to get a degree in drama to then struggle to get a job or end up a very dramatic McDonald's worker. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like the whole system is created for people to go to school, get a job, get buy a house, pay off the mortgage. It's this, this whole kind of ladder. And sometimes you can get to the top of the ladder and realize you're on the wrong ladder. So another challenge that I, I know that I'm aware of that you had was at the time was your age. Oh, you started yeah. quite early, didn't yeah. you? Maybe 16, 17. Yeah. Talk me through that, how you, how you kind of got your first property at that, at that Yeah, age. great question. It was a huge problem. Yeah. I thought that when I got, I was actually 17 when I went sort of full-time in property, and I thought that when I was 18, the banks would open up to me. <laughs> I'd say it would all be fine. So when I was 17, I was finding properties, but I was sort of like passing them on to investors. I was just sort of doing it to create goodwill. I was, I was yeah. also managing properties. I was like renting out rooms and stuff. And so I was making a bit, a small living when I was 17. And I was thinking when I'm 18, then I'm gonna buy. And it's actually a mortgage broker that told me, he said, he was like, Samuel, you do realize you've got to be 21 to get a buy to let mortgage. And at the time that felt like a lifetime away. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm not waiting. And then it's a case of, okay, well, what am I gonna do? So I thought, well, hang on, if I can find a deal, which is effectively a no money down deal, because it can finance by the bank, the way I can structure it, buy it on a bridge, refinance it, same day. If I can find a really good deal, maybe I can put that deal in someone else's name and do mm -hmm. a joint venture. Yeah. So that was kind of like the- And the deal had to be so good to convince them to- Correct. To do that, right? Correct. And then I started finding these good deals and I thought, hang on a minute. If I'm, if I'm able to do this as a joint venture at 18, I don't even have to wait until 18. I can do this at 17. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I ended up buying my first house at 17. Yeah. Where, where, did, where did that desire to you know, get things done and get, get moving in property come from? Because a lot of 17 year olds, they'll hear, okay, I can't do it at 17. I'll go, wait till I'm 21. At most, they were maybe, okay, I'm gonna get educated until I'm 21, then I'm gonna go. Mm. Why was it so important for you at that time to you know, ha have to get this done now? I think I just, I just wanted to be successful. I wanted to prove my teachers wrong. Really? <laughs> yeah, I wanted, yeah, I, wanted, I just yeah. wanted to, and also as well, I mean, when I was, um, when, I, when I just left school when I was like 16, um, I had a, had a very spiritual experience as well, and I got plugged into my local church, and um, as a teenager, they sent me off to a drug rehab center, um, and you know, I started working in Spain, and I had a desire to just help people, to be the best version of myself, to be great. No one had really believed in me when I was at school, mm -hmm. and I just thought, nah, man, there's a fire in my belly, yeah. and I'm, I just want to do whatever I can to be successful, and I want it. I want to do it now. I really hope you're enjoying the show. I would just like to ask for one minute of your time to tell you about my sponsor, whose support makes the show possible, CPC Finance. CPC Finance is a finance broker that specialises in sourcing and packaging a wide range of property funding. You name it, from buy to lets to commercial properties, auction investments, property developments. They are everything you'd want as a finance broker working for you on your property deal. They're extremely experienced. They know their market extremely well, which means they can move quickly. They're on the ball. They've been in the game for 30 years, which has enabled them to, one, build very strong relationships with a variety of lenders 
which as an investor is super important, especially when things don't go to plan. Deals in certain situations aren't straightforward, which is often the case. They are bespoke specialists. And two, they have a brilliant understanding of all types of property investing. They know the strategies, they understand deal structures. There isn't anything these guys haven't seen, you know, they're seasoned pros. So if you're someone looking for property finance of any kind, go to cpcfinance.co.uk and on the homepage, you can schedule in a call at whatever time or day suits. So uh, what were the, you know, you've gone over some challenges that you had. What were like the pivotal moments that kind of excelled you mm. in, a, in property or in business? Well, buying my first house, buying your first huge. House. Yeah. Your first deal is your hardest. Yeah. Huge. Getting the keys and just being like, that's mine. What, what, what kind of deal was that? That was a HMI. HMI. Well, it was, it was technically just a buy to let, but I rented it out room by room. Yeah. So whose name did you end up putting it in? My mum's new husband. <laughs> was, it hard to, was it hard to convince him? Or was you it know what? Forward? I didn't, we didn't, well, we, I, I was going to say we didn't like each other. He was, he was cool. Yeah. I didn't like him that much. Right. You know, they, they didn't get married until I was 12. And, you know, it was a bit like awkward because he was also, he was one of the teachers at my school. Okay. So I was a bit like, oh no, I don't like him. Yeah, yeah. But then it was actually him that inspired me to get into property in a way as well, because he was the person that got me the Richard Branson book. Right. He was the person, you know, it, so, so I was just like, actually, so when I was 17 and I had to go to him and be like, hey, you know, it's not going to cost you any money. I don't. Did I don't it make him money as well? No. No. He it literally. It was a favour. It was a favour. He literally just put his name down as like a guarantor. Right, right, right. And like hosted it for me. Yeah. And now, man, I'm so grateful to, and that's why I say no one's self made, because and sometimes people might say, oh, it's easy for you though, you had a stepdad. But it's like, mm -hmm. well, hang on a minute. If yeah. you find the deal that's no money down, yeah, and if yeah. you, then you'll probably have someone, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like, like if, you, if you find the deals in property, if you get the deals, the, the, the investors and the finance will come. People mm -hmm. think that their problem is lack of money, but actually, as Jim Rohn says, don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you get better, and if you find good deals, then things will just start happening. Yeah. You know, my stepdad never said to me when I left school, if you go and find a deal, I'll host it for you. I had to persuade him. I had to go and find the deals. I had to, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I'm I, super yeah. grateful. Anthony DeVille has a good quote on that as well. I know you know it, because I think yes, you posted it. Yes, I reposted it. You did. It's, um, the hardest part isn't finding the money, it's getting to the point of the deal where you need the money. That's such a good quote. It is, isn't it? I, I had to repost that. Yeah, I love yeah. Anthony. Yeah, so true. People think that their problem is they haven't got the money, but yeah. it's like, actually, I could give you 100 grand, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah. So don't worry about the lack of the money. You get to the point whereby you need the money. Yeah. And then let's have a conversation. Yeah, so, so you, you know, you mentioned at 17, you kind of had that desire to be successful, you know, to prove yeah. people wrong. What was, what was like the first time in your life where you acknowledged money or like the importance of money? Where you thought, you know what, money's important, I need it, I want it. Probably when I was pushing my Ford KA and didn't have money for petrol. <laughs> <laughs> you realise, yeah, I'm missing the trick. Money here. makes the world go round, right? Money, yeah. you need money for everything. So, yeah. I mean, man, every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So going even further back into your childhood, what was your kind of upbringing around finances? Yeah. So um, back background's Christian. My, yeah. church, my church that I got plugged into when I was like 16. Yeah. Um, well, well, I started attending. Um, and my mom's, which is my mom's church as well, was like ex-brethren. So they're quite traditional. So their idea around money was that money's evil. Yeah. This pops up a lot. Yeah. Well, on this podcast, it pops up a few times about the people's like, mindset around money. Mm. And that's one of them. You know, a lot of people maybe resist money a little bit because they think it's greed or evil. Yeah. So that's kind of the kind of mentality that was around you at the time. Yeah, huge. So how, how do you think you didn't kind of come up with that yourself? No, I did. Oh, it really did? hurt me. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so started... you had to change your whole mindset around that before I, kind of I, moving on? I, mean, I spent three years studying the Bible. Because being Christian, the thing that was holding me back was, can I be a Christian and also right. be a businessman? I spent, I, I spent three years, age 20, 21, and 22, full time yeah. studying theology. I, I learned to re, uh, read and write in ancient Hebrew and Greek. Really? And all the verses about money, I circled them and studied them. After that, I, I kind of I stopped spiritually sabotaging my own success because of stupid spirituality mm -hmm. and realized that actually money is just a tool. It's not good or bad. Money won't change you. It will just expose who you really are. And it's not about what you've got. It's about what's got you. It's a yeah. heart thing. So um, how, how did it kind of, did it affect many relationships when you started going into business and started you know, making money and teaching people how to be successful in property? How well, the teaching kind of came way later. Right. I mean, I didn't register my training company until 2016. Okay. So I bought my first house and went full-time in property in 2009. Yeah. So it came quite a lot later. I'm, you know, I'm only 30 still yeah. today. But I think money, it does affect relationships. A lot of people, 
um, you know, they think if you're if you're a business person and employing people, or even owning more than one house, a lot of people genuinely think that it's unethical to own more than mm. one house because they think, well, hang on, a house is a home; it's a commodity. Yeah, you should just own your own home, and that's it. And if you own someone else's home, home then you're a parasite, and you're sucking the blood out of this person who has to live there, and they think it's unethical. So, yeah. man, it's just a minefield. So much, you know, so much emotional baggage around money. It's yeah. incredible, not just within me and my life and my family and my church and my background, but most people. Yeah. So what, what are your kind of thoughts on that? How do you kind of get over that in your own mind? Or how did you get over that in your own mind you know, to think where you know, money's, it's all right to make money? Mm -hmm. I just studied it like crazy and thought, well, what's the alternative? Yeah. If it's wrong to own a business and make money and employ people, then therefore it's wrong to have a job. Because if you have a job, you're, by having a business, you're actually providing jobs. Yeah. It's capitalism. Yeah. What's the opposite of capitalism? Communism. What does communism mean? Communism means when the government take everything from everyone because the people are too stupid to look after the money and then they distribute it. That's never worked. Let's really think about this. Um, I think it's quite obvious that making money is not a problem. Yeah. Money, money it follows value. So if you're trying to make money, people think that as well. People think in the property market, oh, you're just squeezing money out of tenants, by pushing up the rents. It's like, well, hang on. It's just supply and demand. Yeah. If I overcharge the rent, I'm gonna have an empty house. Yeah. I, I've never got gotten that one. Do you know? What? I think the way you can make it unethical is if you know that, you know, maybe someone who who's renting your place, they've got nowhere else to live whatsoever, and but that's never the case. It's never the case. But this is just so it's hypothetical. This is make it yeah hypothetical. Yeah. Whatever, it could ever make sense. Say for example, you you was really thirsty mm. and you needed water. You're gonna you're gonna yeah. die. And I had this water here. And I yeah. said I'm gonna charge you a grand for it. Yeah, because I know that you're struggling for it and you need it. That's the only way it could kind of supply and demand. It means, it means we need more business people to sell more water. Yeah, yeah. But just in that in that moment, it's like that could maybe come across unethical yeah, because yeah, yeah. I know you need it, so I'm going to bump it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're choosing to rent. You're choosing to but accept the price. But capitalism of the rent. will always sort out every problem because if that was the case, people would be like, "Oh my gosh, Kevin just sold a, 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 some water for a grand. Yeah. Everyone, let's do water, and, then and then everything gets sorted out, yeah, yeah, yeah. and capitalism wins." Something I've um, never asked you before, which mm. I think I know the answer to. But when you was um, younger, did you have any like, entrepreneurial traits or moments? You know, a lot, a lot of people have like, like I had in the playground, I'd sell sweets. Mm. Do you have anything like oh, that? Oh yeah, man. When I, was, when I was at school, I started a um, plastering company. Oh, you were at school? Yeah. How I couldn't, old? I couldn't even plaster. <laughs> How old was you? I was like 14, 15. Right. But the th that's the thing. How, how, how did that work? So, on my summer holiday, I went on a plastering course, spent five days learning how to plaster, 250 quid. From pa I used paper round money right. to buy the course. Yeah. I got the basics of how to plaster. Couldn't really do it. Yeah. Started advertising myself to plaster. Had some jobs. Messed them up. Had a ceiling to plaster. I couldn't really do it. So I'm like, man, I've charged someone like 140 quid. So then I found a plasterer from Yellow Pages yeah. and asked him to come and do it. I said, how much will you charge? And he was like, 70 quid. So I got him to come and do the job. I made a little bit of profit. I was like, <laughs> yes. Literally had a plastering business. Where mate. did that come from? What do you mean? Then how did you get that idea in the first place to start doing that? And why did you do that? Was it just to make some more money? I think I was, I think I was, when I was, when I was like doing maths, mm -hmm. I think there was like an example somewhere in the maths equation. The teacher gave an example and said, for instance, if you're a plasterer, ah, right. somehow it came up and, and I was like, hmm. Yeah. So you was, at the, you was always thinking about kind of money at that time, how you can make more. Yeah, I was trying to make money just, you know, to be able to, yeah, I was. Do what you want to do. And... I was, I've always, I've always, even as a kid, I was like, right, how can I make money? How can I, Cause, do you know why though? Yeah. Because I was thinking I probably won't be able to get a job. Right, right, right. Because I'll be so unqualified. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when I leave school, how am I going to eat, yeah, man? Yeah. <laughs> You know, but yeah, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, what's your kind of thoughts on, on the schooling system at, at the minute? I know terrible. it's something that you talk about quite, quite a lot. I think it's terrible. Yeah, in terms of financial education, yeah. pretty much nothing. Right? Absolute nothing. Yeah. How, how would you change it? I think that the, the government could realise that they need to add financial literacy in, as part of the curriculum. So yeah. that on a Friday afternoon, there was an hour's session Mm -hmm. on the difference between good debt and bad debt, on liabilities and assets, yeah. on investments. Who on, would teach that? Well, who would teach any lesson? 
He would teach maths, he would teach English, he would teach poetry, he would teach history. Someone... Yeah, but then, then I guess to an extent, they've kind of studied that. A lot of maybe teachers now... Yeah, but if it's in the themselves. curriculum, it's just, this is it. Facts. Right. So they'll teach this the teachers and then the teachers will... Right, this is it. This is the difference between an asset and a liability. You don't yeah. have to necessarily be like a super rich... Just this the basics. Is just it. This is the basics. Yeah. It's not how to be a millionaire, mm -hmm. just the basics. Right now, Managing people, what you have. people leave school right now, they don't even know the first thing about money. Yeah. You know, or, or they'll go to a bank and they'll get a loan to, to, get, to, to get married and, that's, and everyone thinks that's fine, yeah. but they'll, if, if they're getting a loan to start a business, everyone's like, oh, it's risky. It's like, what? Yeah. People are just absolutely financially clueless. Yeah, yeah. Well, quite, yeah, definitely. And I think that's um, kind of the, the aim of this podcast. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's kind of trying to change things in that respect. Because um, I've seen it loads, obviously, growing up mm. and then now um, in the sport industry and along with my teammates. It's a huge thing, and, uh, Massive, and the, the more I learn about it, the more I realise how other people. You want to share it. I want to share it, right? As well, and it just yeah, it just makes it so much obvious. The more I know, it makes it so much obvious. The more people don't know. Mm. So, kind of stemming on from that, you've got uh, three kids. Mm -hmm. What do you think, or what are you trying to implement into their lives financially? Probably not yet. They're probably too young. Um, but as they get older, what would you implement into them? I think I'll find what they love and what they naturally aspire to do and then yeah. encourage them in that yeah. and let them know that they can do it. And if they want to be, uh, you know, a footballer, mm -hmm. I mean, again, like you're a footballer, right? Played professionally, made a lot of money, awesome. But if, you're, if a kid says, I want to be a footballer, generally speaking, the whole system will be like, nah, that's a pipe dream. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm a property millionaire. If a kid says, I want to be a property millionaire, nah, 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 nah. Mm -hmm. The whole system is get a job. Yeah. Now, if my kids want to get a job, I want to be a vet, I'll say, great. But if they say, I want to be a footballer, or I want to be a property millionaire, or I want to be an actor, or I want to be something a little bit different, yeah. then you can do that. That's fine. Yeah. I'll just, I, think, I think it's just about letting people know they can do what they want if they're, put, they're prepared to put the work in. So that your kids are going to come from a very different background to how you came, yeah. how you grew up. I know, man. How are you going to cope with that? Well, how am I going to cope with it, or how are they going to cope with it? I think, yeah. I think um, you know, they'll have a lot more opportunity. They'll have a lot more experience. Do you think it's tougher coming from... I think it's different. Different. I mean, it's hard, right? Because a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of multimillionaires started from nothing. And, yeah. and, and, and having nothing kind of gives you that mm -hmm. to make something. So when you're born into wealth, it's a whole different ball game. So yeah. I think for them, they're going to have to be, I mean, I, I, they're too young probably. You know, my eldest is four. Yeah. So it's probably, it's probably a bit early. But for me, I'm not going to spoil them. If they get any pocket money or any kind of money at all, they have to pay taxes on that. Nice, okay. And you, why don't you smile? No, because it's interesting. I mean, that's a, it's a good one. It teaches them about the reward. Dude, right? I got killed with the tax because no one told me when I was a kid at school. Yeah, 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 of course. pay taxes. Oh, of course. Right? If you have a business, you've got to pay tax. Yeah. So I started making money and I forgot to put half aside for, the, for, yeah, for, the, yeah, for, yeah, for Her yeah. Majesty. Yeah. And then bang! Yeah. You know how many people have gone bankrupt over that? Yeah. And also I think as well, just, just sort of teaching them the value of money. Mm -hmm. I'll take my kids to some, I'll take them where I grew up as a kid. I'll take them around some of the rough estates of Warsaw. I'll be like, see that house? That's where you're gonna live. Yeah. Unless you roll your sleeves up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Don't think this is normal. Yeah. You know, but it's gonna be an interesting one. And I'm, I'm learning every day as a parent. I think I kind of made my mind up now, but in terms of kids, What's your thoughts on public and private school? Um, private. Easy decision, no brainer for you? Or? Not an easy decision, no brainer, but I think that it's just better, isn't it? Yeah, why, 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 why so, why do you think? Well, because it's, um, I think that with private schools, I think that the teachers and the school almost see you as a customer. Yeah. So you're, you, they just- Better service, because yeah, you're paying. Better, um, I think private, I think it's just better. Yeah. Personally, but maybe I'm wrong. That's been 20 years. Yeah. Although ironically, I went to a private school. All right. Which will shock people. It was, and when I say private, it wasn't like really expensive. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. private because it was a Christian school. Got oh, yeah. So it wasn't a state school. Oh, did, it was you, Christian. So did you have to pay for you to go? There? Yeah, yeah, you had to pay, yeah. yeah. But it wasn't a lot. And yeah, it yeah. killed her to do it. Right. But it was educational wise, like the, the, the quality of the teaching and stuff was probably worse than a general state school. Yeah. But it was a private school. Yeah, my, my, my thing was, so I come from a public school and a lot of you know, great people come from public school and private school. But the thing with, with mine, why I wasn't too sure about it, was that I didn't want to um, put them into you know, a kind of environment and then they know nothing about the other environment. Mm. But then I guess, so, I guess if they go to a public school and they don't know much about 
the private school either. I guess that's on the parents though as well. Yeah. And also, it's your job as a parent to make sure that they're well-rounded. Yeah. I'll, t- I'll take them to work. I even do. I take my kid. I take my eldest. She's four. I take her on property viewings, and you know what I mean. So nice. you kind of have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I think you have to not just not just delegate the education of your kids mm-hmm. to somebody or an organisation. It's like no, I got to do this myself, and of course they can assist and help. And they're they I can't teach the kids maths yeah. and this and that because I'm not very good myself, you know. Yeah. But I think really as a parent, I think you've just got to take responsibility of, of, of your kids' education. Yeah, and I guess an upside. What I speak to a lot of people about that they like the upside about is you know the kind of contacts and businessmen and successful people that your kids can meet. In, in private school, which is yeah. probably a, a big upside. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, I ended up probably making my decision where I thought, you know, if they're in um, private school, they kind of miss out on maybe like, you know, the culture and understanding people that don't have as much. I would say like my worst fear is maybe like my kid going around to someone's house who don't, don't have as much and saying, oh, you know, why is your TV so small? Something like that. That's like mm. my worst nightmare. So I think that's why I was like, no, I want to go public. Mm. But then at the same time, then he's missing out on you know, the other side of things where you've got good contacts, um, really clever people who's done really well. For me, it was, you know, it was back and forth about which one. That's what I say about taking my, my kids to where I used to live and be like, that's where you're going to so live. That's how you get both. You, you know what I mean? It's yeah, just yeah. showing them what, you know, letting them be cultured and rounded. Yeah, cool. So one of the things, um, obviously a big reason why I got you on as well, I wanted, to, I wanted you to share with, my, um, with the audience a little bit. You know, one thing that you're amazing at is... Um, different ways and different strategies, how people can get involved and start making money in property that you know, have little to no money. So I wanted to go for like a quick crash course of like different strategies, yeah, yeah. just quick, quick fire ones. For me, I was amazed when I came to your crash course. I remember it like it was like yesterday. Yeah. Another day, 2nd of December, 2019, came on crutches. I remember. I just had surgery like the day before. Um, came on like front row. And I was amazed by the amount of strategies that there are in property that people just don't know about. Mm. Um, so I wanted to go through them a little bit and kind of yeah, yeah, sure. break it down quick. So um, rent to rents. Rent to rent is when you control a property instead of buying it. So hotels, most hotels are large rent to rents. The hotel business will rent the building off of the owner and then run it as a hotel. So rent to rent, an example would be if you rent a, if you rent a little studio apartment for 500 quid a month in Manchester and then put it on Airbnb and booking.com, mm-hmm. rent it out for three grand, you don't own it, but you're making a lot of monthly profit. Yeah, and how, how, how would you convince a landlord to give you the control of their property? Why would they do that? Well, for, it's better for them. They're going to get the full rent. Yeah. They're going to get a long-term let. They're dealing with commercial contracts, so if you don't pay the rent, you've not got the same rights that a tenant that lives there does. It's way better. Rent to HMO? Well, that's when, same story, but instead of putting it on booking.com and Airbnb, you'll rent a property and you'll rent it out on a room-by-room basis. Yeah. And again, control it, make the monthly cash flow. And that's a, it's a really important point as well because cash flow is king. Mm-hmm. And everyone wants to buy property to own it. I see a lot of people spending 25 years saving up for a deposit to buy an investment, and the investment makes them 300 quid a month. Yeah. And it's like, congratulations. You, how many times do you need to do that before you can become financially free and leave your job? Yeah. Whereas if you can control two or three properties and get cash flow, then that means yeah. you can then have time to then start building your own portfolio and, and you know, ultimately get out your job. And that's a business module of like a lot of successful companies, right? Yeah. Amazon. 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 Yeah. Airbnb, Airbnb, they don't own the hotels. Yeah. Amazon don't own the stock. Uber don't own the cars. It's all about control. Uh, Rockefeller, I think it was Rockefeller that said, own nothing, control everything. Yeah. Controlling things is massively underrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, lease option agreements. That's really nice. So lease option agreements is where you- You posted about this actually. You said it's like super important for 2022. Huge. Like, why, why do you think- Most that? of my deals today are lease options. Right. Yeah. All right, let's break it down what it is and then we're going to that. So lease option agreement is when you lease something with the option to buy it later. So for yeah. example, if you see a house for 250,000 pounds and you wanna buy it, but you haven't got the deposit, you can say, hey, I'll buy it now, i.e. I'll take over the mortgage payments, I'll become the landlord, but I'll pay you in five years time. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you might think, well, what the heck's in it for the landlord? Negative equity properties, inherited properties, where they've just inherited it, they don't need the money now. Yeah. So that's just a really powerful, way to get on the property ladder without a deposit. You need to pay one pound. But the reason I'm doing so many is because also you can, let's say if you wanted to buy a big property or a pub, let's say you wanted to buy a pub and you want to turn it into apartments, but you need planning permission. You don't want to buy the pub in case you can't get planning Mm -hmm. or in case you have to wait years. Like I always complain about with some of my sites that I bought, 
But if you take it on an, on an option and you fix the price to buy it in say in two years, you can then get planning, push the value up. But if you don't get planning, you walk away. So it's just such an incredible, it's such an incredible tool. And any property investor that's worth their weight should understand lease options. So you, you were saying this year, that's kind of what you're focusing on? Well, not just this year, the last few years. The last few years. Yeah. Well, why, why now do you think it's so important? Because a, a few, it's only the last few years when I've more sort of slipped into development yeah. rather than just property investment. And I've been getting a lot of land and stuff. And land is all about planning. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to buy sites and not be able to get the planning. So that's why I've been using options. So it's about no money down deals as well. Are they possible? People think they're not possible. Well, it, it, property investing is a business. So of course you can start a business without money. Of course you can. It just means, yes, you're okay. Look, there's, there's, there's ultimately there's three currencies. There's time, there's money and there's knowledge. Yeah. So if you're buying a property and you haven't got money, well, do you have knowledge? Do you have time? Can you maybe put sweat equity? Mm -hmm. yeah, it, of, of course it's possible to buy a property and get on the property ladder without a big deposit to start with, but you're yeah. just gonna need some knowledge and some time. There's so many ways. Yeah. Um, but I think people, people that say you can't do it are actually correct. The people that say you can't do it, they are correct for themselves. For themselves. Because they just don't know how to do it. You think that's the main reason? Is that the main reason why you go and do financial freedom challenges? To prove that that can be done? Yeah, that's one of the reasons. Yeah, what's I, the other one? I enjoy it. Enjoy it. I enjoy <laughs> yeah. the hustle. So um, for people that haven't seen your financial freedom challenges, yeah. explain, explain it to them and what, what it is. So you in 2018, I got so, a uh, couple of years after I started training people. Yeah. So 2016, that was when I set my training company up. And a lot of people were sort of coming up with excuses as to why, oh, I can't do it. I haven't got the money. I haven't got the this. I haven't got the credit. I haven't got, coming up with excuses. Yeah. So I decided to sort of take on their, take on the excuses of the world upon myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Lock myself off from my bank change my identity, strip my, all my contacts, yeah. and start again. And I thought, I just wonder what will happen. So I left my wife and, 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 and my little girl at the time, Ruby, and she was like, really upset, because she thought yeah. she might not see me for six months. I said, I'm not coming home until I'm financially free from scratch. Right. And, and how, how did you define financial free at the time? 2,000 pounds a month income from right. property. Yeah. And I left, and I, we, we, I was a group of people, we, everyone, about 200, cities and towns went into a hat and at random I pulled one out got it and went there with nothing where was it Sh Sheffield Sheffield yeah Not bad place. and I didn't know anything about Sheffield yeah, yeah yeah so I went to Sheffield came back seven days later with a little property portfolio <laughs> financially free why did you do two thousand pound is that kind of just what you thought maybe the average person would spend yeah a month two thousand pounds like the average salary right, right so although right. I can be making that in, in yeah. you know in property income a month with a little portfolio yeah then that's enough to be able to how, how did you do it? What kind of deals did you get? Um, mostly rent to rent. And I used deal sourcing. So I packaged deals and sold them to make some quick cash. To and then even have... then you built up your own investors Yeah, at I, that point? I was left with nothing. Completely nothing. Yeah. I, it was tough. I yeah. got chucked out of networking events and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Why? Oh, mate. <laughs> Love it. Um, someone, saw, someone saw I had a mic on and was like, what are you doing? Because oh, right, right, obviously right. it was filmed, but it was yeah, all filmed yeah, secretly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all filmed secretly, but that, that was crazy, man. I blew up and it was all on BBC News and it was huge. Yeah, and you've done a few now, haven't you? you yeah, I've done, um, the, I'm about to do one next week. That'll be like my ninth. Yeah, but then you also do one with your students. Yes. But you go in and live in their houses yeah. and help them get financially free. Yeah. Why do you, is that, is that more of a, I mean, that must be crazy rewarding at the end of it when you're like. It's crazy, hard work, yeah. that's what it is. It's easier on my own. Yeah. Cause you know, but it's crazy rewarding as well. Yeah. yeah. See, like people like Evans had 23 pounds in his bank mm -hmm. and now he's making a year later, a year and a half later, he's got a nice portfolio, just got planning permission coming on his deals. He's making about 12,000 pounds profit a month. Yeah. Completely life changed. Now he's got engaged and it, for me, it's, you know. Yeah. What, what, when you were doing it with them, what were the challenges that you found within the people that you were doing it with? Is it more of like a mental thing? Yeah, um, yeah, mental thing, yeah, for the guys. Because everyone says oh, they want to do deals and they want to get rent to rents and they want to do this. But then when actually yeah. when they do it and the paperwork's on the table, most of them feel sick, chicken out, don't want to sign it. Mm -hmm. They think they want the deals, but actually when it comes to it, it's like, <gasps> they, they freak out. Yeah, because of what? Mental. Risk? Risk, yeah. Mm -hmm. if it, what happens if it doesn't work though? Yeah. Because they're thinking, I want a rent to rent because it will make a grand a month profit. But then when they get it, they go, well, hold on. It should make a grand amount of profit, but yeah. there's a chance it will lose money. Yeah, yeah. 
And I'm like, it won't. Yeah. It's possible. It's very, very slim. But the fact that there's a slim chance, even if it's 1%, is enough to make them freak out. Yeah. What about uh, BRRR by yeah. Refurb? So that's kind Refinance. of like my first deal that I did, really, yeah. um, without the Refurb, because they changed the rules. So that's when you re you're basically, when you've got a pot of money, or someone else's money, mm -hmm. and you're recycling the money. So you buy a house, refurb it, push the value up, and then refinance it according to its new valuation and pull out all your initial funds and you're left with like effectively a free house. Mm -hmm. um, that's like what CREP did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what, in fact, that's what most wealthy investors do. You've been open about the figures on the avenue, CREP's, CREP's still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you, do you go through what, what um, I don't know if I can remember the off the top of my head that. exactly. But I know. But it, just just so they understand yeah. how you can end up having you know, so he a bought, free house. I think he bought it for like forty something. Forty three. I know he bought it. You know the biggest one. I, 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 I only know the the purchase price. He bought it for forty three. He then refurbed it. He spent about thirty grand from memory. I have right. I put all of this on YouTube. Yeah, I've interviewed yeah. him about it. So they can find it. But roughly yeah. forty three. Thirty, 30 grand, grand refurb. Yeah. So, so he spent. About so he spent about seventy five grand all in. Yeah. Upon completion, I remember this. He had a cash offer of one hundred and ten grand. Right. So he could have sold it. He kept it though, right? And he kept it because he didn't want to pay tax. Right. So he chose to refinance it to pull his money out. Yeah. He's now renting that out. It's a HMO um, and he's making decent money on it. Yeah, so yeah. He's, he's happy anyway. So buying a house. He's a smart guy. Buying a house, you refurb it, pushes the value up and then you end up refinancing and based on the new value, you know, you can um, pull out majority of your yeah. money, if not all of your money. Yeah. And then, you got a house sitting there. And I think he's renting that little house that he bought for 43 grand. He's renting that for like 1,200 or 1,300 yeah. a month. And it's a HMO as well. It's so it's HMO. The cash flow is yeah. a lot more than usual. Yeah. So one thing that you're getting into quite a lot is, uh, is developments. Mm. Um, how would you feel about, what do you think the easiest way for someone to get involved in developments are that as well? Again, yeah. it's a little bit harder because developments normally requires a little bit All more right. money. So, how could you get into it? Okay. So firstly, development is hard. Yeah. Hard, hard, hard. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can lose a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to get into development, I would say do one or two things. Either do what you did, which is partner with somebody, and that way you're learning as you're doing, yeah. which is cool. The other way is if you want to get into doing like big deals and development, start on some small deals and just like work your way up. Yeah, I think that's probably... Like that's the ones probably, we just mentioned, like the, the buy refurbished yeah, finance. Yeah, exactly. So start with like a buy refurbished finance, like a little 50 grand house. Yeah. Understand it and then be like, right, now I'm going to go for add a zero. Now I'm going to go mm -hmm. for a 500,000 pound. Yeah. And just slowly get bigger and bigger and stretch yourself. That's probably the smartest way to do it. Unless you're doing it as like a joint venture where yeah. you've got someone involved that's a bit more experienced. Um, which is also, I've done that as well. When I, when I started getting into development around about like 2017, 2018, I invested some of my profits from my investments into developments to learn the process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I invested in... Um, you know, other people's deals lent money out and kind of yeah. watched and I've done a lot of joint ventures and sometimes I've funded and sometimes other people have funded. But if you're doing a deal that you've never done before and it's a bit out of your comfort zone, just make sure that you've got the right people around you to consult you and yeah. it's really important. What well, do you think the importance of the ability to like raise finance? So you just mentioned there that you would have funded some, um, some yeah, developments. Yeah. So maybe there would have been, you know, a few um, developers or, you know, people starting out that came to you yeah. looking for finance. Right. What did you see in them that allowed you to say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to back you and put money into this track deal. record, track record. Yeah. Yeah. People have done it before track record. Um, and also relate good relationship. Even if someone's, you know, good at what they do, I want to have a relationship with them where I feel like I yeah. can do business with this person. Yeah. It's almost like a joint venture is almost like a marriage. Uh, you wouldn't marry somebody that you didn't, know and trust yeah and i think it's the same with business so you definitely feel it's like you know there are ways to get involved in certain things without necessarily needing money there's other ways to bring value mm. is what i'm trying to make yeah there are yeah i mean you've got it you just got to think if you're doing a deal with somebody you've got to think what am i bringing to the table yeah. if you've not got money don't harp on about the fact that you've not got money people come to me all the time and they're like i've got no money i'm 19 Mm -hmm. um, I've got bad credit, I live with my mom, yeah. what advice would you give me? I'm like, well, firstly, <laughs> I'd say stop counting all the things that you've not got going for you. Yeah. Tell me what you've got going yeah, for yeah. you. Why are you even here in front of me right now? You know, maybe, maybe instead, maybe you should be saying to me, I'm 19, I spent a thousand hours watching property investment videos on YouTube. Yeah. I've got a lot of time on my hands. I've got a car and I can travel and do viewings. What advice would you give me? Great. It's like, if you're playing a game of if you're playing the game of poker and you, and you doubt a hand of cards, 
you don't go, oh, I've not got an ace, I've not got this. You go, hang on, well, what have I got? And then, you, and then you deal the cards and you play to yeah. win. And in the same way, if you're starting out, if you've got no money, that's fine. Having no money is going to be a problem. Having yeah. no money is going to be hard, especially yeah. if you've got like nothing at all. It helps if you've got five, ten grand. But if you've got no money, okay, cool. What have you got? What are the cards you've got in your hands? And then deal those cards. So we've kind of gone over, um, you know, how to get involved in property, how to make money with, um, you know, very little to no money. What about those who, you know, they may be, um, you know, like my background, people made money through um, their talents in the sporting industry, music, mm. whatever it is, that had another business. What kind of game would you play if you're, um, you know, you've got a bit of funds there and you're wanting to get involved in the property? Yeah, well, firstly, I wouldn't get distracted by trying to do rent to rents or deal sourcing. Yeah. Because, you know, I, and, and I coach a lot of people that are starting out with nothing. Mm -hmm. And I also do coach a lot of people like yourself that kind of came to me and are like, right, I've got a bit of money to play with. Yeah. And the first thing I said to you is, put all your time and focus onto your football. Yeah. Of course. Of course. If you're a musician and you're making good money from music, that needs to be what your whole, and yeah. you know, so so there's two types of ways to make money from property. There's there's fast pound and there's slow pound. So fast pound is is basically being a property entrepreneur, running a property business, mm -hmm. rent to rent, deal sourcing, it's quick cash. And then there's investing money. Yeah. And if you're already making quick cash, like from football, or even if you've just got a business, if you're if you run a um, you know, maybe you run a law firm yeah. and you've got a nice business, it's making good money, great. Focus on making money with what you're doing here. And then with the profits, I'd put that, I'd then recycle that money like yeah. you've done. I'd recycle that money and put that into, it, put that into buying uh, property, properties that you can push the value up. And you can then- So what, so what kind of strategies out. would you do? I'd do buy refurbish finance. Yeah. I'd do commercial to residential. So let's use, let's use a, a footballer for instance. Yeah. Um, the so property has got a bit of money, but they have no connections whatsoever. They have no knowledge of property whatsoever. What, what would you I would what probably would you be to them? I would probably partner with somebody. Yeah. So you I need would, to get out there, come out of your industry, yeah. start connecting with people. Connect with people. Don't, I said this, it reminds me of deja vu. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I said this to you at the beginning. Don't rush in on the first deal. Be a bit picky. Yeah. Tell people what you're doing. Um, connect with people that are successful in mm -hmm. property and, make, and you can see the evidence that they're making good money, they know what they're doing yeah. and potentially look at doing a, doing a joint venture and putting your money into one of their deals, splitting the profits yeah. and letting the person, your joint venture partner, they can put all the time, sweat, yeah. energy, project management, that's yeah. what they're bringing to the table, you're putting the money in mm -hmm. and then you're working some kind of a maybe 50-50 profit split and, and some people might say, I wouldn't want to give 50% away but 50% of a million quid is better than 100% of nothing. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, you know, and when, and when you're doing this as well, make sure that you str you were smart, man, because, well, you invested in training, right? Mm -hmm. But that but that's a smart thing. And another thing is you were smart because you made sure that you had solicitors representing you. You made sure that the joint ventures that you did were structured properly. Yeah. It's so important because if you're giving money to somebody, you need to make sure you're not giving money. For instance, you could set a company up and then you're loaning money to the company, it's still your money. If you're yeah. putting 100 grand into a deal, you're not just giving 100 grand to, yeah. some, to some person to invest and fit crossing your fingers, no. Yeah, yeah. You're loaning that money to a company, the company's then working hard with a proven track record, and then once the deal's done, you're taking your 100 grand out plus the profits. So yeah. it's just gotta be structured right, you've gotta make sure that you've got charges and restrictions on the properties, um, and you've got contracts, and, um, and it's done properly. But yeah. I would say, even if you're partnering with someone, don't do it blind. Don't just be like, oh, I'm partnering with someone, so I, I can just go in with my eyes closed. No. If you partner with someone, still get a basic level of understanding about property like you did. Yeah. So you understand what you're doing. You knew what you're doing. If you'd have had the time, you could have done it yourself. Yeah. But you were so busy on your football. Mm -hmm. So you trained yourself up, then you invested in other people's deals. That's the smart way to do it. So I th I'd probably say that would be a good... Yeah. But it is, it is, to be fair, it didn't start like that. Um, and I think this is maybe a, a bit of a problem with, um, you know, I've, I've, we talk about like it's a lot of property investing and investing um, and things that people do off the field. And I think like a common problem is, you know, we go and do things with no training whatsoever, yeah. no connections outside of the football space itself. Yeah. And we make a lot of mistakes, like I've, I've made a few as well. And before the training, and I think a lot of other uh, players do this as well, is they'll just go and buy quite blind. Yes. You know, they might have, they might move to a new team and just buy a place that's there. They don't work out ROI. They don't yeah. know what that is. I didn't know what that was when I bought my first two and I paid for them. 
Yeah. And I've only now actually just exchanged on two, that when I worked the R ROI after, literally after the learning from your videos and, uh, and the crash course, I worked out my ROI on the properties I had, I was like, oh shit, yeah. something's wrong here. Yeah, and you're gonna pay for your education or you're gonna pay for your mistakes. Yeah. You know, I've done um, both. you've done both, <laughs> <laughs> right? But still, though, even even if you buy a property blind, if someone's yeah. watching this and they're thinking, I haven't even got the time, or then if you buy a house blind and you don't even bother to get a mortgage, if you're cash rich and you just buy a house mm -hmm. and rent it out, that's still a lot better than leaving it in the bank. Yeah, and spending you know? it or yeah, so you're gonna nothing on it. you're not gonna probably not gonna lose money doing that, but yeah. you're gonna leave potential profits on the table big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so um, and I know a lot of people do that. That you know, make a load of money through music or football and they go and buy a bunch of houses, yeah. and it's like, it's still a lot smarter than spending it on gambling, or going, yeah, yeah. To, or, or going to all the, casi you know, the casinos and buy fancy cars, um, but it's not as smart yeah. as you could do. Yeah, but the, for the people that you know, are really committed to making money, you know, there's much smarter ways to do it, where you yeah. think, when I think about the ones I've done, I'm like, oh, I've left so much money on the table. Mm. I could have, the amount of money I spent on those, if I had the education I had now, I could have made so much more. And it's also funny how, how simple, because sometimes it can feel like a minefield, right? Because there is a lot to learn. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, like I've, a lot of a lot of people have reached out to me, and I've spent like literally three hours with them. Yeah. They know nothing, and within three hours, they know more than most professional property investors. Yeah. It, like you, even when you came to the crash course and that, you leave, and it's like actually, I know more than a lot of people that are professionals. So yeah, yeah, yeah. there's not that much to know. Yeah, yeah. I'm putting myself out of business now as a trainer. <laughs> but there's not, that. there's not. No, but I think, I think that's know. kind of a bit of a testimonial to you, to be fair, because you, you kind of break it down really well. Yeah. And you make it not so overwhelming. So it's kind of easy to learn. And I think there's obviously things that you miss out that you, you know, that could get too confusing that you kind of just got to learn as you do things. Yeah. But I think you kind of just break it down, make it real simple to understand the concept of it. It's like, okay, I understand the concept now. Now I can just get moving. And, you know, there's some things you can't teach. So, um, one thing that's obviously really important when we you know, we're talking about the money game is having multiple streams of income, you know, not relying on just the one. Right. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that and maybe kind of the other um, streams that you've built. So um, I know you do quite a lot of things, you know, you, you write books, you do a bit of public speaking, you've got your training. So moving into your training a little bit. And we're speaking a bit off camera actually, so we're talking about incomes, but sometimes you mentioned that even sometimes you kind of deal at a loss because of the amount of value that you give. Mm. Talk to me about that and kind of the finances around like training and... Yeah, so training, yeah, we spend a lot of money, you know, pe people mm -hmm. don't see the, um, the overheads yeah. and the costs that come with running a proper training company. Yeah. See, I, don't, I do a lot of free training where people can come to programs and come to events or maybe watch YouTube videos, which obviously costs. Mm -hmm. But when, I'm, when someone's investing in one of my advanced courses, what I don't realize is that comes with mentoring. Yeah. That comes with so much resource and support. And um, you know, it, it's, it's not cheap putting it on. So from a profit margin perspective, yeah, I mean, my training company is, um, <laughs> we've, we've made a lot more years than we've made a profit. Yeah. I don't take a salary from it. Because yeah. it's up and, you know, so that's a big a misconception that people have on, on the train. I think so, it? because I think people think, and this is the <clears> worst thing ever. When I see people do this, it just makes me cringe so bad. When someone gets into property and then like six months later, they start a training company and it's almost like they think that it's just a bit of easy money. Right, right. Or, oh man, this is hard work. Yeah. Packaging and selling deals. And it's like, come on, man. If you're going to set up a training company, in my opinion, you need to have been in the game for at least five years. You need to have been through a recession. You need to have made serious wealth. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And most importantly, you need to be doing it from a position of passion and love for your students, mm -hmm. not trying to make some extra money. Yeah. You need to make sure you're compliant, you have all the insurances, compliance procedures. It's not a simple business to run. So that's one of my businesses. And as you said, I've also got loads of other stuff that I've done and been involved with, but all of them are linked to property. Yeah, why, why haven't you started training people? Why did I start? Yeah. You know when I told you I went to Barber College for three years? Yeah. And I kind of like realized that actually making money is not a bad thing. When I left Bible college, um, I kind of wanted to help initially. I wanted to help people within my church that had a passion for business, but felt bad about it or felt guilty about it. So I set up like a non-for-profit organization called Training Kings, mm -hmm. which was teaching people around the ethics of money and starting a business. And it was really just for people within my church to begin with and people from churches. Yeah. And then that sort of snowballed and people started asking me, well, hang on, you've made all this money in property. How have you done it? So I put on um, a property event and um, a lot of people came and then they were like, when's the next one? And oh, can you help me? Can you mentor me? Can you? Yeah. And it just sort of 
I think I did it because I was asked and then I started my training. I started doing a bit of training and then I then um, got married and kind of retired. Yeah. And after retirement, I was just bored and my wife was like, you really need to get back out of the house. And yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. so I just thought, you know what, I'm going to dedicate my life to not just making money in property, but also helping other people and pulling other people up yeah. in the way that I wish I'd been pulled up by people, you know. How did, how did you scale it? The training because, business. Was it just through word of mouth from like, you know, when you started to what it is now, now, what well, cross courses you're getting, how many people, a few hundred people every cross course? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I did scale it really. Pretty much all of the training is run by me. Yeah. So I think the way to scale a training business would be to put, put everything online and just like do loads of ads yeah, and, yeah. you know, which, I, which I've never really done. Because yeah. I love training just really, people. It's really organic how you kind of grew. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just love being in a room. With, and it's word of mouth. Nearly all of our students are just coming from word of mouth. Um, someone came, became financially independent or got their first deal and then send their whole family. Yeah, that yeah, happens yeah. all the time. One person will come as like the guinea pig. Yeah. And the next thing you got like 10 people and then the whole family come. And then 10 people turns to, they tell everyone 100 people. And it's just organic. Yeah, yeah. One thing I love about um, the kind of culture around... Your, uh, your training is that a lot of students actually end up becoming business partners mm. or they, they actually become uh, trainers themselves, mm. which you've got, I know you've got a few um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That involved now. Talking about that, how, how mm. does that kind of come about? I think a, a true leader doesn't create followers, they create more leaders. And for me, I'm not trying to create big numbers, I'm trying to create big people. Yeah. I'm investing my time and my life into people. And when they become financially independent, maybe they're making three, four grand a month, for them, that's just the beginning. A lot of them mm. want to go on to set up charities, just yeah. businesses, maybe to write books. Um, I do businesses with them. A lot, a lot of them have gone on to set up their own law firms, mm. mortgage companies. Podcasts. Podcasts. Yeah. And, and, and that's great. And some of them, yes, some of them are trainers, and, um, which is great because they're, they're spreading the word. Or not, they might not necessarily be tra have a training company, but they're just you know sharing the word. Or maybe some of them are... Um, come and give back as volunteers at some yeah. of our courses. And during the breaks, when people are all a bit confused or trying to find deals, yeah. I've got like a team of volunteers that yeah. have all been through the training themselves and are now giving back. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just great. Do you do, you, um, do you do any public speaking outside of your own training? No, not really. I'm Why too not? busy, man. I'm too busy. Do you, do you get offerings though? You'd, yeah. be, you'd be amazing at it. You, have you ever done any? Now I'm thinking about it. I've actually I, never seen you. I've, I've, I've spoken at a lot of churches. Yeah. I think, I think the, the, I wouldn't say I'd never do it, but I'm just so busy. Mm -hmm. So, why would I? I could just put on another event tomorrow and open up a room, and I'd have a couple hundred people. Yeah, yeah. What? What? Going to speak at someone else's program? I mean, I could do it. I think I'd want to get involved in it oh, cool. at some point. That's awesome, bro! Yeah, Come yeah. down to one of our events. Yeah, you want to give me a gig? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I need to, yeah, I need some practice. Yeah, yeah, man, of course. Um, another stream of income is that well that you may have is, is books. I know you've written quite a lot of books. Sorry, we can't just leave it at that. We'll get a date. We'll have to get a date. Dinner, dinner right now. All right, let's get a date. A date for you to speak. Yeah. So how about April, if you're free? You're, you're busy with football, yeah, bro. Yeah, That's yeah. your problem. I do not. If I can get my missus in here, we've got to get a date. She knows my schedule better than I do. Yeah, we can get your missus um, in here. We'll get a date. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get a date. Um, yeah, books. So I know you've written quite... Do you know what? I actually had... No, they're not, they're not put it on set today. I actually have one of your books. What's here. wrong with your team, man? Where, where are my where books, books at? <laughs> there is one. I, I can't remember is what there? Is. I think it's... Um, Making compliance easy. If you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one fun. book that I didn't actually write, but great. Oh, that was your student's book. Yeah, you? that was a book that I published for my students. For your students, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah, the books. Yeah. How, how did, um, when did you write your first one? My first book was 2016. 2016. Yeah. How do they go in terms of income? <laughs> you give them so many away for free, don't you? Oh, mate. Um, income wise, I would say, personally, if you want to become wealthy, Definitely don't write books. <laughs> oh man, yeah. it's so bad. Yeah. I mean, Amazon take like 95%, bro. Really? It's just the worst way to make money. I've sold, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands, at least a hundred thousand, probably more like a quarter of a million, but no, nah, it's just it's a terrible way to make money. Well, how many have you done in the minute? I think you've done about six, six or seven? Eight. Yeah, seven or eight. I'm in one of them, thanks for that. Oh, oh yeah, uh, oh, yeah. Of, course of course you are, you're in one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, ri I've written I one book. I remember one came out, I was like, make sure the volume two, I'm in that one. Yeah, 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 you're a good, you're good story. I've written one book actually, which I'm, I'm trying to get published properly, because all the others I've published myself. Yeah. Um, I'll make even less money on that. Right. Because when you get it published properly, it's even worse, because then you've got to pay the publisher as well. Yeah. Um, but I'm really finding it hard, you know. In terms of what? I can't get a publisher to pick it up. Oh, really? Yeah. 
So we'll, we'll tick that one off from the streams of income. But yeah. yeah. Oh, mate. Do you know what? I'd love to work out. I should work out how much profit I've made. Yeah. It would probably be like 50 grand or something. Is it, is it super tough to, to write a book? No. From the start to getting it, getting it out? No. No? No. Maybe that's why my books don't make any money. Because it's not tough. They're not, maybe they're not good enough. Yeah. Now they're good. They sell well. They're best. They're, all of them are bestsellers. Mm-hmm. But like, what does that actually mean? A bestseller. Being a bestseller. Um, it means that they're Amazon bestsellers. So it means that they were the bestseller within a category. So oh, maybe okay. in property, real estate, it right. was number one selling on Amazon. Got you. For a particular time, maybe for like three minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you screenshot it and tell the world. Uh, it counts. <laughs> um, what about socials? Yeah. Do you make money through socials? Do you monetize that? Because I know mm. you're, obviously, you're fairly quite big on YouTube. Nah, not I heard really. YouTube normally pays well or not? Nah, I don't think so. No? I don't think so. I probably made on YouTube in my whole life. Bear in mind how much it costs to put a YouTube video out. Yeah. Videographers and stuff. Yeah. I've probably turned over, I would guess, about forty thousand pounds from YouTube. Since that's how much I've collected since the start. But but that if you think about how much it costs to hire videographers and yeah yeah yeah, I'm at a loss. Yeah, to be fair, I've heard I've heard good things. Good. Yeah, they're, they're probably you know talking like yeah, but no no no. How much how much money did you make off that one deal you did in Birmingham? Um, well, there's probably for me probably just a little over a, a million. Okay, a little over a million. I'm not being pessimistic, but for you to make that on a podcast. Will probably take. It would certainly for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take decades. Yeah. Your reason you're doing this podcast isn't for the money. Maybe you'll make money, and that's awesome. But really, yeah. it's, it's got to be passion. Yeah, you know. You've sure. got to love doing it. Sure. You know. But so, yeah. And the spin-offs, man, because people know who you are. Mm-hmm. And if people know who you are, then you can do joint ventures. I wouldn't know you yeah. if it wasn't for you on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, and a lot of a lot all the people well, I've done deals. A lot of it comes from people knowing who I am. So you've got to just see it as you know what. It's just it's branding. It's fun. It's passion. It's mission. But if you're trying to actually make money off of books, most of my books I give away for free anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, they're I think, on my I website for free. Four books I have of yours, you gave them to me. <laughs> <laughs> and they're on my website, you just get them for free. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you can't be doing it for the money. Yeah, you yeah, just yeah. absolutely can't. Yeah. And you can't be doing training for the money. If you're a trainer and you do it for the money, it will come through and mm-hmm. your, your delivery and your love for the students and your time and dedication. I, I spend so much time, I dedicate my life to my students. Yeah. But you wouldn't if you were just doing it as a transactional thing. I think that's why most training companies just disappear after six months, mm-hmm. which they do. Do you know that's one question I wanted to ask you today was that you know, I feel like so much of your time has gone into your students and your training. Yeah, man. How do you end up balancing that with your own like property deals? Mm, it's so really big developments going on. How do you balance the two? I think, demand it? I think for a start, I've got a really good team yeah. on my property side of things. So a lot of my property business is, system, is systemized. Mm-hmm. So I'm working with my two brothers. Yeah. who are amazing but no it's hard it's just like sometimes i do think i'm giving out so much yeah i'm like man i got my own stuff that i need to deal with but that's all part of the fun and the adventure but yeah it's just you gotta love what you're doing sometimes i'll, I'll probably work 100 hours in a week but if you're loving it then it's kind of not work it's just i'm just living yeah yeah, yeah. you know so yeah. it doesn't feel like work but yeah i mean some days i do just think you know Wow. <laughs> What's your thoughts on pe- when people say, oh, you're going to burn out? Do you believe in that? Nah. You think burnouts are people that maybe do things that, that don't like doing what they do? I think so. For me, it's like eating. So, you know, if you don't eat, what? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a mental like this analogy. <laughs> now, I think you will. I think, you know, when you don't eat for ages. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's say if you didn't eat anything for a week, right? Mm. You wouldn't then go and eat a week's worth of supply yeah. in one sitting, right? Yeah, yeah. And rest is the same. You only need a day or two, in my experience, to rest. Yeah. I can, be, I can work myself to the bone where I get home and I pass out on the floor shaking. And you still need only eight hours sleep rather than... Yeah, well, maybe a bit more, but I still need a day or two. For me, I know that, I know that two days is enough for me. When you charge your phone, yeah. right? your phone can be completely burned out. You put it on charge and you know within maybe I don't know, six hours. It's yeah, yeah, I'll go for in. me, no matter how burnt out I am, no matter how wrecked I am, one to two days... I'm fully recovered. Yeah. That's how I've always been. Now, I'm not saying that for some people, if they have like a nervous breakdown, some people might need a lot longer, some people might need months, but I've never experienced that in my life. For me, it's just been after two days, I'm fine. And after two days, I'm like bouncing around the house, mm-hmm. wanting to be on stage, wanting to be crunching deals, wanting yeah. to be analyzing and negotiating. 
that's just how I am. Yeah. So if I'm really tired, I just take a couple of days off. Yeah. And then I'm fine. And every Sunday, I'm Nothing. off. Nothing. What do you think about? Um I know you, I, I remember we spoke about uh, a, a little while back about you kind of thought you maybe got to a point where you started getting a little bit complacent. Oh man, I don't feel like that anymore. You know, that was 2018, boy. Yeah, this is 2022. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, that was so yes, yes, yesteryear's problem. Yeah, I, I'm not like that anymore. But I remember that. Yeah, what was the kind of mentality around that? Was it? It was just kind of like when I spoke to you then. I was, I was kind of thinking, what's the? I've made enough money to retire yeah. forever. You know, multi-millionaire. Mm-hmm. I kind of felt like, oh, well, I'll have fun. And I was still working. And I was doing a bit of training, a bit of this. Yeah. I was doing a few deals. But I was, I was very kind of complacent. I wasn't like, brah. But Grant Cardone kicked that out of me. <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah, well, Grant was. helped with that yeah, a lot. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. He's like 65-year-old just smashing it every day. And you're thinking, Grant- hold on, I'm 28. Yeah, and- right. You know, I thought, why is Grant Cardone? Because secretly I wanted to be grinding and growing and yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. But then I thought, well, oh, but then what's the point? And then I saw Grant Cardone in his 60s and he was really grinding. And I thought, well, he's richer than I am. Yeah. He's in better shape than I am. And he's in his 60s. Why is he working so hard? I need him to mentor me. You know, yeah. I need him to spend a bit of time with him. That was when I realized that actually you only get one life. And I want to be, I don't want to be remembered for making a load of money. I want to be remembered for helping a load of people mm-hmm. and making a lot of impact. And if they're going to build a statue after me when I'm gone, I can't yeah, be working yeah. 20 hours a week. You know, you can't just go, oh, I've made enough money now. It's not about the money. Yeah, it's yeah. about living life to its fullest and, and being the best version of yourself. Yeah. Speaking of that, speaking about Grant Cardone and mentorships, how important do you think it is to have mentors? I think it's really important. Yeah. Why pay for your own mistakes when you can pay from somebody else's? Yeah. So I think it's vitally important. It's having somebody that's been there and done it, that can tweak you and, um, oh, man, I just think it'd be crazy not to. I've got so many mentors. Mm-hmm. I've got so many mentors in every little avenue. Yeah. I've got a mentor. And you spend a lot on that, right? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. How much do you reckon you spent on that mentorship? Oh, mate. I've spent millions of pounds. Really? Yeah. Worth every penny? Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. But, and it also depends how you define mentors. So some, some of my mentors, it's like, depends how you break it down. Like some of them might be, like I consider my lawyers mentors. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm, I'm paying them for advice. Mm-hmm. and I'll be asking them why and learning and I'm yeah. studying law at the moment actually but how do you find the time to do that? because I work all the time and I love it but I'm also studying like right now I'm spending a lot of time studying planning permission so mm-hmm. I just reached out to somebody who's one of the best planning consultants in the, in the UK yeah. and said I want to spend a few days with you man Yeah. can you just meet with me and can I just learn from you he's like well what do you want to know I'm like I don't know <laughs> but I know that I don't know as much yeah. as you know <laughs> and I know that yeah. I don't know what I don't know, so let's just meet, man, and let me just spend some time with you because I want to get good at this because, yeah. you know, so uh, that's why I've got so many different mentors. Yeah, 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 definitely. And that's one thing I realise as well, being in business, that sometimes you, you've got to kind of pay to play yeah. a little bit yeah. to get in the right room in front of the right, right people. So going into a little bit about your portfolio and what you've got um, on the go at the minute, mm. what have you got on go? I know you've got a few developments going. Currently got eight got? developments yeah. going on. Um, all kind of signed, mm-hmm. heads of terms and everything. Um, yeah, quite a bit. So I've got a site in Leeds, which we're waiting on planning permission, which is taking forever, yeah. which you're asking me about. We've got um, a couple of option agreements in Buckinghamshire at the moment in Aylesbury, yeah. which we're getting, again going through planning. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously got Ribsford House, which is also in planning. That's why I want to get a planning mentor, because yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. obviously doing something wrong, because it's taking forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, a lot of developments. Um, we've we, we've uh, just, bought a, just bought a place in... Um, London, which we're turning into flats. Um, I've obviously got all my portfolio, like all my little houses and, 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 yeah. and stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm really busy yeah. and and hard work, but I appreciate Ben, my brother-in-law, he's mm-hmm. just incredible, and my brother Russell, they're both pretty much full, well, Ben's full-time, Russell's pretty much full-time. My yeah. wife, uh, all of our, most of my family are like working on the business full-time, it's just yeah, me yeah, that's yeah. going around training and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, nah, lots going on. Yeah. So you posted the other day about a deal you're doing. That's like, you put the figures out how much it's going to yeah. make you. Yeah, yeah, over a million. Too soon to talk about... One million pounds and 78 grand. Too soon to talk about what it is? Yeah, that's a, um, a land deal, um, which we just exchange contracts, which we're, if planning comes off, which I'm very confident it will, mm-hmm. um, 12 houses. And um, yeah, really exciting. Again, I'm not going to count my chickens before they've hatched, but yeah. you know... One thing I wanted to go into, which is kind of vital um, around you, and it's something that I think you deal with like really well, is um, 
you know, once you start making money and you build successful businesses, it's going to come with criticism. Yeah. And it's something that you've, you've come across quite a lot over the last um, few years. How have you kind of dealt with that? Um, I think, you know, when you get criticised, you need to remember that it's an opportunity to grow. Yeah. So criticism is a really good thing because if no one's criticising you, then you can't really get better. If everyone's patting you yeah. on the back telling you you're great. So you see it as an indicator of growth. Yeah, Yeah, and generally, if you're getting criticised, yeah. there's generally, not always, because I've had some criticism in the past that's been completely unfair mm-hmm. and completely terrible, yeah. um, which I've had to really stand up against and, you know, we've had to take legal action in, in some instances in the past. Yeah. But generally speaking, if you're being criticised, there's probably an, a grain of truth in it. Mm-hmm. If someone's saying... If someone's saying, oh, you're too aggressive or you're too this, or you're, it's like, well, maybe I don't agree, but of course I don't agree because I'm me. Yeah, yeah. But then it's like, well, actually, is, is there some truth in this? Someone once said that wolves don't listen to the opinions of sheep. Yeah. So it's also saying, well, hang on a minute. If I'm being criticised just for being wealthy, or if, it's important as well to have a team of people around you that are, you're accountable to. You can actually say, hey, listen, you know, am I to this? Am I to yeah. that? Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I've received my fair share of criticism, but then if you can't take the heat, then you shouldn't really be in the kitchen. Yeah, so the thing that you mentioned in there, which I, when I think about it, it's um, kind of like a, a big thing when we're talking about playing the money game, when you get to a certain point, yeah. is maybe like lawsuits and court cases. Right, yeah. They can cost a lot. They yeah. can cost you, do you know what I mean, significantly. So what was your kind of mindset in terms of going in, into them? Mm. Was, it like, was it about picking and choosing your battles, which you think, you, you think, you know, that's gone too far, I need to go into that. But from a financial standpoint, was there any that you thought, um, you know, this could be a bit dangerous or not worth it? Just what's your mindset around going mm. into court cases? What's your experience? So there's different types of court cases. There's obviously court cases with tenants. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm talking from my perspective now. I'm sure there's millions. From my perspective, there's, you know, if people aren't paying your rent. Yeah. Um, I've, been to, I've had to go to court with tenants, which is always sad. And I think, you know, it's always a last resort. And if, if someone's not paying your rent because they can't afford it, or they're really stuck, they've lost the job, you're not just going to go, right, I'm going to sue you and yeah. evict you. And, you know, um, but there's, there's tenants and then there's investors. If a deal goes bad or if someone tries to steal money from you, or yeah. um, then there's, you know, defamation, if people saying stuff online. For me, taking people to court is, is like a last resort. I wouldn't I want to do that. I'd rather settle and have peace and just mediate or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, I think there's some people, and even some people, even out of principle, if people take it too far, yeah, um, you have to, you have to do it to, you know, for your, for your, for your customers and for your family and your staff, and to protect, you know, your brand and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's part of being a business person. I remember, yeah. I remember, I one, one time, I've, well, I've met Richard Branson a couple of times, and I remember finding out one time. I think he said, I think he said that at any one given time, he's got a hundred lawsuits going on at one given time. Right. And then I'm like. 100 at yeah. one time I mean most people would be a nervous wreck yeah, yeah. so it's like it is part of being a businessman if you're going to go through business and if you're going to have thousands of customers and deal with thousands mm-hmm. of tenants and investors and you're going to have to just t- take it on the chin at some point you're going to have to sometimes take people to court and be taken to court so we're going to um, going to wrap this up with just uh, like a quick fire round yeah so it's um, just minimal words first one is buy or rent 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 yeah but I've actually got a, a bone to pick with you you know why <laughs> you know why so, yeah. yeah yeah so uh, talk me through that because I think one of you know we both follow Grant Cardone quite a lot and yeah. that's what he's so big on that you shouldn't buy your own home you know mm. um, but, buying your buy, homes are for banks you know they're not for people mm. and you should always rent 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 and you've been you know a big advocate for that as well yeah but you have bought your own house but he also says yeah you get to a point where you make so much money it don't matter anymore yeah is that yeah. where you're at uh, that house that I bought, I did rent it first. I rented it yeah. and I loved it so much. When the landlord evicted me, we're well, not evicted me, but when the landlord said, hey, I'm moving back in, I was like, no. Right. And it was actually Grant Cardone that also said, everything's for sale. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So I was just like, man, I, I, I really yeah. like it. So we decided to buy it. Just because, just because the kids are settling and, you know, we do, we do still rent as well, though. We've got a house that we rent down the road. Mm-hmm. So we do sort of switch up a little bit and whatever, but it's yeah. nice to just be rooted. Um, but what I would say is, don't buy until you are a millionaire. And you just love that house so much, you didn't want to let it go? Yeah, I just liked it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, free money habits that the rich do or don't do that the poor class middle class do or don't do. Okay, I think there's a lot of talk at the moment about, you know, cancel Netflix, yeah. don't drink Starbucks, save, 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 and buy yeah. a house. And to me, I think that's garbage. 
I think that. I don't know anybody that's a multi-millionaire that said, um, I got to this point because I didn't drink Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So in terms of habits, I would say read, invest in yourself, um, be positive, don't complain, um, and, and, and just be better in yourself, looking for opportunities. And, and, and biggest thing is environment. Wealthy people hang around other wealthy people mm -hmm. because bad company corrupts good character and you do not want to be around. I'm not talking about broke people just financially, I'm talking about mindset, yeah, yeah, yeah. like complaining, whingy, you know, so, so I know it's more than three. No, no, nice, nice. Um, three myths about property. Three myths about property. Yeah, I'd say the biggest myth about property is that passive income is a myth. Right. People say, oh, passive income doesn't exist. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. Of course it exists. You know, that's the biggest myth about property. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say another myth about property is that you need a lot of money to get into property. Yeah. Um, another myth about property, number three, will be, you know when people say, if you wouldn't live in it yourself, then don't buy it and rent it out to somebody else. That's stupid. Yeah. Because, because as long as it's safe and habitable and clean, it's going to be mm -hmm. right for somebody. It's about, it's just market. It's like market research, supply and demand. Yeah. This whole idea of, could I kill two birds and try and live in it myself? It's, just mm -hmm. ridic it's ridiculous. What's the biggest risk you've taken? The biggest risk I've taken was probably telling my dad when I was 16 that I didn't want to work for him and I wanted to go full-time in property, even though I had no money. That was probably the biggest risk. What was your risk in there? A beating? Well, yeah, falling out of my dad, yeah. and then also not having any security, yeah, yeah, off yeah. on a limb, you know? That was a, bit, that was yeah. a big risk. Um, Did he support you in that? No. No? No. What's your biggest loss? Biggest L? <sighs> biggest L? Oh, man. Um, could be financially like a deal where you lost money on. Yeah, yeah, I've lost, I've lost. My b biggest L was when we went into lockdown. Yeah. And I was selling some of my small houses and I had them all ready to go to auction. And you know when you're selling a house in auction, you set the guy price really low. Yeah, yeah. Because then it gets attention and then obviously people they bid and it goes up. Yeah, right, yeah. so it's marketing. But then the reserve price has to be within 10% of the guy price. So my biggest L was when I did the auction, <laughs> I did the auction at the end of Jan for April. That was the day I'd have paid everything. It was all set, signed. Yeah. But then we went into lockdown, coronavirus, right. that beginning of 2020, and I ended up selling my houses literally like a thousand pounds above the guide price on each house, and I lost a lot of money. But yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. at the end of the day, <laughs> it, is, it is what it is. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, I mean, overall, I didn't lose money because I, I still sold them for higher than I bought them for. Yeah. But I lost, I lost, I lost money compared to what I, if I'd have just held well, them up for another two months or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was a bad, that was a bad one. Seven yeah. houses. Um, this might be a tricky one, yeah. but can you give us a tax trick? A tax trick, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so claim everything back, figure out, find out what's tax deductible and what's not. Yeah, but even there, do you, there's still maybe room for a bit of creativeness. How creative do you want me to get? You want me to yeah. go? Oh, I want you to go creative. Oh, you want me to go super creative? Um, I, think you've, I think the biggest tax thing, so I mean, there's so many different taxes, right? Mm -hmm. you, you pay tax when you buy a house. Yeah. You pay stamp duty tax. You then pay tax when you rent the house out. <clears throat> Income tax. You then pay tax when you sell the house. Capital gains tax. So it's just like thinking, how? Firstly, just being aware of yeah, what yeah. the taxes are. All right, a creative tax um, trick will be if you if you buy a house to do up and sell, like if you're flipping a house, live in it, and you'll pay zero capital gains tax. Yeah. There's there's one, but there's there's, there's hundreds. Yeah. So you you do you mean? To buy one, live in it, just to live in it for a little bit. For, yeah, so if you, to claim it as a right. So if you, if, if you buy a house and yeah. the whole sole purpose is you want to buy it, do it up and sell it. Let's yeah. say you buy it for a two hundred grand, you spend a hundred yeah. and then you sell it for five hundred. Yeah, it's two hundred grand profit you're going to make, uh -huh. but you're going to pay ca tax on that capital gains tax. Yeah. which if you're a, if you're a high rate taxpayer like like me and you, yeah. you'll pay twenty eight percent. So that's quite a lot of tax you'll pay. That's mm -hmm. like what like almost sixty grand tax. Yeah. Whereas if when you buy it, if you buy it to actually live in it. How long have you got to live in it for? Six months. Six months? Yeah. But if you, but the refill is probably going to take six months anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, this might not be appropriate for everybody, but it's, been, it's worth being aware of. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, there's loads of, loads of taxes. Yeah. So a flat that I bought 2016, I lived in it for a year, and then I moved. Mm. And I've been running out for the last couple of years that I've just sold. Oh, oh, I don't know about that. I'd say, 
I don't want to get I don't want to get too right, right, right. detailed because I'm not a tax expert, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. know. But uh, I'd probably check check your account on that one. Oh yeah, but, okay, yeah, cool. Um, what's your thoughts on um, other asset classes like crypto, NFTs? They're quite upcoming. What, what, what do you think about that? I, I think it's great. Yeah, I think um, you're doubling that a little bit. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think NFTs are, are more than double. NFTs are, are the future. Mm -hmm. You know, NFTs. Are, I mean, I'm very conscious of not talking about stuff that I don't feel like I'm equipped to, to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Within real estate, but you think property. they're a good thing. But I think they're a good thing. I think the very fact that we've, like, for instance, Bitcoin, that you can pay people and move money around. Yeah. But the government and the banks aren't involved is amazing. Yeah. And I also think NFTs. I mean, NFTs is. But lots of things are NFTs that you don't even think about. Like, for instance, if you buy a plane ticket, that's an NFT. Mm -hmm. So you're you're buying. It's not just clip art. You're buying something that can give you access to something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm very excited about NFTs. Yeah. Very excited. But at the same time, I'm always going to have 95 percent of my my wealth in property because property is property is never going to go out of fashion, is it? It's also never going to go to nothing. Yeah. Like Bitcoin could go to nothing potentially. Everyone's going to need a home. Yeah. Buy land, you know, build. Everyone's going to need a house to live in. So I think it's the best asset. Um, well, second best. The best is yourself. Nice. That, you answered two questions there. because You answered my next question was going to be why invest in property. She done that. Yeah. Um, and last one is um, a marketing trick. Marketing trick? Marketing trick. Um, I think a marketing trick would be, oh, what, when you're like selling a house, you mean? Or? No, no, no. In terms of, you know, like your brand or a product or yourself, to pushing yourself out yeah. there, marketing yourself. So for example, a podcast, marketing the podcast. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say just be completely yourself. Too many people copy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they're trying to do whatever it might be, get a new product or start a new business, their product is just like a duplicate of somebody else. Yeah. It, what, did, what did I say to you, man? Next week, I'm doing a financial freedom challenge. Yeah. And you said to me, you told me to watch... Undercover billionaire. Oh, right, right, right. And you said no. I said no because okay. I'm like, as much as I'm sure I'd love it, I'm about to go and do an undercover millionaire program, which, by the way, I've been doing for years before undercover billionaire or yeah, certainly yeah, before yeah. I even knew it existed. So it's like, I don't want to watch it because if I watch it right now before I go out and do a financial freedom challenge, I might kind of copy it, even yeah, by yeah, mistake yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't watch a lot of people. Or we, It's like, I just want to be, I'm not worried about what other people are doing within my, the industry. I kind of just want to... So I think for marketing is just be completely be yourself, be authentic, don't worry what people think, don't be afraid to be down people's throats. Um, yeah. You know, yes, you will annoy people sometimes, people won't like you, but just, you know, let your light shine and let it shine bright. Can you give me three people that you'd recommend come on the podcast that you, that you can make happen, so no pressure? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I think... That I can make happen. I think Grant Cardone would be pretty cool. That would be an amazing one. He's literally probably one of the ones that inspired this podcast. Wow. Yeah. So that'd be, that'd I be could huge. ask him. I could that'd ask Grant about that. He's pretty, he's pretty, um, yeah, I think he'd probably come on. He's a really, really nice guy. So you've got guy. to get me a speaking gig. And you've got, you've to, got to get Grant, Grant on. on. Two other people. I, you know what? I would interview, um, I'd probably get my, get my brother, Ben, on. Yeah. He, he's like so filled with knowledge. Um, I don't know if I can make this person happen. I, I probably couldn't, but it would be really cool if you could get Martin Lewis on as well. Yeah. Any other, he's like the money guy, right? If you're, you're yeah, yeah, money, yeah. money, you know. Yeah. Any students that you think? That you um, yeah, I would probably, oh, if you had, a, you could, I bet you'd have a great like, convo with Evans. Evans. Because he's literally 12 grand a month, fully in on property. Yeah. He's been, he started doing nothing. He's been in the game 18 months. That would be a really good one. Nice. Um, so yeah, there's a few, cool. bro. Perfect. Samuel, that's amazing. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for playing the money game. Well, thanks Appreciate for inviting me, on. man. And well done with the show. Keep it up. Thank you. No, it's been good. Um, as well, anyone watching that want to learn more about Samuel's uh, journey and what he's doing, his property training, we'll leave his socials somewhere in the video. If you're looking to get into property, I would fully advise you to check him out on YouTube, his, uh, his socials. You know, he's um, the guy I use to get involved in property and he's helped so much with my journey up to now. So thanks so much. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate and, um, it. See you soon.